know the reason why we wanted to play these songs for you. We all know these songs. You hear them on the radio over and over and over again. And sure, they're great. We've danced them at many weddings and maybe on anniversaries. But that's earthly love, superficial love. Nothing, nothing comes close to God's love. And it's not until we spend some time in Scripture, then we realize the depth and just how amazing and perfect God's love is. I'm going to read you a little bit here from the Apostle Paul. One of the most famous letters in the New Testament. He wrote, in 1 Corinthians 13. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I'd be nothing. If I gave everything that I have to the poor, and even sacrifice my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It doesn't demand its own way. It's not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice. It rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Love never fails. Love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Love never fails, it never gives up, Never runs out on me, your love. Oh, Lord, your love never gives up on me. Okay, let's sing this together. And it's higher than the mountains that I Stronger than the power of the grave, and it's constant through the trial and the shame. This one thing remains. It's higher than the mountains, and it's higher than the mountains that I. Stronger than the power of the grave, and it's constant through the trial and the change. This one thing remains. This one thing remains. Your love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love. It goes on. i 
let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time of worship together. Lord, we know that no day is a guarantee. It's a gift. And so we thank you for this beautiful day. And Lord, we started out the message today and we our service today and we sang songs that we've all heard over and over and over again. But Lord, the words just, they seem more shallow once we dig into your word and we sing songs of praise to you. And Lord, our hearts are just with you. We ask that you move in this place today. This world needs a little more love. And so we just ask that you be with us. And uh, you just move amongst us and change hearts today. And that's our bold prayer so that we can see. So Lord, thank you again. We just love you so much. And all God's people said, Amen. All right, turn to somebody and say, I love you, man. Okay, just say good morning. Say good morning. <laughs> settle down. It's too much fun. Yeah. All right. Uh, the ushers are going to come forward. We're going to receive our offering this morning. It's just another way to express our love, our gratitude to the Lord. And uh, while we're doing that, let's take a look and see what's going on around this crazy place. Welcome to Bay Point Community Church. Here's what's happening at BP Now. Everybody, this is Drew Hale. One of our key values here at Bay Point is the value of celebration. Over the last couple of weeks, July 15th and July 29th, we've had the opportunity to see 40 people be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're not familiar with what baptism is, it's simply an outward sign of an inward commitment to Jesus and to his kingdom. So today, we have the opportunity to celebrate with these people that have taken the next step in their journey to being fully committed followers of Jesus. It was amazing to me kind of getting to be a fly on the wall uh, during some people's baptisms because for every person it looked just a little bit different. For some it signified a brand new start, a new chapter in their life. For some it signified just a deeper walk, a deeper commitment to Jesus. And for some it was the very first time that, it, that they'd ever decided to trust in Jesus. So there's a lot to celebrate today. information about what's happening at BP Now, 
visit us online at bponline.org or stay tuned right here to BP Now. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon. Why don't you give a big round of applause for the people who were baptized? That was awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you're here today, and uh, this is uh, hard to imagine, but this is the last series of the summer. Can you believe that? I don't know how in the world that happened. But um, kind of get, to get us started, in 1964, a long time ago, before a lot of you were born, there were four lads from Liverpool, England, who started a musical and cultural revolution. They were named Paul, John, George, and the Irrepressible Ringo. Okay. Well, did, did you know, speaking of the Beatles, did you know that Abraham Laboreal, who was here, did you know his son is the drummer for Paul McCartney? And Abe Jr. Yeah. I didn't think it was that exciting that his son was the drummer for Paul McCartney. But anyway... Abe Jr. has drummed for Paul McCartney longer than Ringo Starr did. Well, okay then. And, and do you know how the Beatles selected Ringo Starr as their drummer? Um, oh. so they, they selected Ringo Starr as their drummer because Ringo was the only one who would hit the crash cymbals. Because British drummers were all like... So it's, it's all very interesting how, uh, how the Beatles kind of started this um, amazing musical and cultural revolution that continues on to this day. So I don't know what all the laughter and cheering was about, but it had to have been something really awesome. So. But we are starting a series called You Say You Want a Revolution. And even in my lifetime, there have been a lot of revolutions and there have been a lot of revolutionaries. Not all the revolutions are political. There's, there was a sexual revolution that went along with the 1960s. Um, and there are music revolutions. There's financial revolutions. There's, but, but, but when you think about revolutions and revolutionaries, you tend to think about the political world. And most of the time, those kinds of revolutions are marked uh, with blood and violence. And the revolutionaries themselves are often just brutal, um, bloodthirsty tyrants. When you think of some of the revolutionaries uh, of the 20th, maybe the 21st century, names like Lenin and Stalin and Castro, and I'm sure there are others come to mind. But when you think of names like that, if you did a word association, you, you tend to come up with words like fear and oppression and brutality and greed and corruption. But <clears throat> When Jesus started his revolution, and my whole premise this morning is that Jesus is the greatest revolutionary who ever lived. By, by it's, I don't even know how to say it, by a wide margin. And, but the revolution that he started, nobody attributed those kinds of words, fear and oppression and brutality, to Jesus. The revolution that he started was a revolution of the likes of which the world had never seen before and it has not seen since. It was and continues to be fundamentally a revolution of love. No one else's life even comes close to the impact of Jesus from the world of art and literature to education and medicine, science and philosophy, politics, civil rights, philanthropy, and, and even faith itself. The Jesus revolution was and is so significant that it actually split history into B.C. and A.D., and not only that, but Jesus, and this is not true of all revolutionaries, Jesus lived his own revolution, this revolution of love. It's one thing to espouse an ideology. Yeah, I'm, I stand for this, I'm going to do that. But to live it is another thing. Jesus loved people, and they, they knew he loved them. That's why they would walk for days just to be in his presence to hear him teach. That's why people would walk away from their fishnets and their, their tax collector booths just to be in his presence because they knew that he loved them in a radically different way. So we're going to explore this revolution that Jesus started, and I want to do it by tying it to the mission of our church. If you're new to our church, you might not know this. Some of you will, but our mission statement is built around uh, basically three phrases. First is 
love God, and that, you know, both giving and receiving, and that, that leads to grow believers, growing deeper in our faith, and that leads to, to basically reach people that don't know him with what message? The love of God. So, I mean, if you think about it, the, the mission of our church and the, uh, the revolution of Jesus, it really begins and ends with this concept of love. If I were to boil this message down to one statement, it would be this. Love sparked the revolution and love sustains the revolution. I, I like to keep it simple so that, you know, maybe, maybe 24 hours from now, you'll be able to go, yeah, what was that message about? No, it's about love sparked the revolution and love sustains the revolution. So let's, let's take a look at that first part about love sparking the revolution. Uh, you can turn to, to this in your Bibles, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. It's John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. This is a statement that Jesus made to his inner circle of disciples shortly before he died. And here's what he said. He said, a new commandment I give you, love one another. Now, if you're familiar at all with the Old Testament, that, that part of Jesus' statement is not the... That's not the new command. That actually comes out of Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, way back in the Old Testament. But Jesus goes on and he says, as I have loved you, that's the new part, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And then he says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. How? If you love one another. If you love one another the way Jesus loved. So if you want to know who the true followers of Jesus are, you got to follow the love trail. you got to follow the trail of love. you got to look for people who are loving in the same sacrificial, selfless, humble, kind, compassionate way that Jesus did. So love according to Jesus would be the defining characteristic of the revolution. It would not be a part of it. It would not be a, a sideshow. It's at the core of his revolution. But I want to, I, I think we need to think about this because just like the, the variety of songs that we heard from uh, Just the Way You Are to Love Shack, I was just saying, who does Love Shack on a Sunday morning? But, but it was kind of cool, I, I'm just saying. And, but, but, so it raises the issue of what kind of love are we talking about here? What kind of love would spark the kind of revolution that's going on for over 2,000 years? And, and I'm going to do the best I can to describe what I think in some ways is indescribable. But in, in the New Testament, there are four different words that are used to describe different facets of love. The first kind of love is the Greek word, that's an R, eros which gives us the English word um, erotic. So this would be passionate, uh, male-female, sexual love. And, and uh, this is probably like love shack love or whatever. I don't know. It's just, it's just you know what I'm talking about, right? And it's, it's a good thing God made it. But when you take eros, that physical, passionate, sexual love, and take it out of its God-ordained context, that which is really, really good can get really, really dark and twisted and ugly. So this is not the love that Jesus was talking about when he started his revolution. There's another kind of love, and it's called philia or phileos. I'm going to just put um, BFF by this one. Best friend forever. This is the, uh, in fact, if you look at this word, philia, and you attach the Greek word for brother, which is Adelphos, it gives you what, what modern word? Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. So this is kind of an emotional, it's a very deep connected, but it's kind of an emotional love. And you know what our emotions are like, right? They're up, they're down, they're all over the place. That is not the love Jesus was talking about to spark the revolution. There's another word, it's spelled in English, S-T-O-R-G-E, it's pronounced storia, which is like a family love. It's the the, the, the Bible, the New Testament talks about uh, followers of Jesus as brothers and sisters, a kind of family love. In fact, there's a verse, the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 12, verse 10. If you bring that verse up, we have it. Yeah, there it is. Love each other with that sense of genuine affection. That's kind of a story, uh, family love. But that's not the love that Jesus was talking about when he sparked this revolution. He was talking about a different kind of love. And it's interesting, this word is unique to Christianity. There is no other parallel for this in any other religion. You will not find this concept in Hinduism. You won't find it in Buddhism. You will not find, you really won't find it in Islam. 
You will not, this, is, this is one of these terms that's very unique. In fact, the word which is used over 250 times in the New Testament, so it's a very common word in the New Testament, but it's not found very often outside of the New Testament in the Greek world of its day. So it's a very rare, very special, it's like a jewel of the Christian faith. This fourth kind of love, some of you will recognize the word, is agape. When Jesus said in John 3.16, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, the word there is, for God so agape the world. So what is this agape love? What is it about agape that sets it apart from physical sexual love or that kind of emotional friendship love or that sense of family love? What, what is this agape love that we're talking about? C.S. Lewis described it as a detached love, but not, not detached in the way that we might think of it. He, he said it's detached in the sense that agape love seeks the good and the blessing of others without attaching conditions and expectations in return. In that sense, agape love truly is unconditional. It's not I love you if, or I will love you until, you know, certain conditions are met. It's, it's, it's a different kind of love. It's a, it's a love that basically says, I love you, period. Irrespective of whether or not you receive and reciprocate that love. So how do we begin to get a handle on this kind of love in a world that's filled with eros? Eros is a, it's a wonderful expression of love, but it's not the revolutionary love of Jesus because, as we all know, eros gets a lot of ink, it gets a lot of print, it gets a lot of attention in our culture, but we see that that, that rarely sustains a relationship over the long haul. Filial love is powerful as it is, I see BFF friends busting up left and right because it's kind of fueled by emotion. Even storge love. Um, I, I see families, church families, individual families, unfortunately, who once pledged their lifetime love to each other just walking away. What is it about this agape love? Because when Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 13, Vicki read it so beautifully earlier. When he said, love is patient, love is kind, you know, and so forth, he said, it's, it, he uses the word agape in, in every one of those statements. When he said, agape never fails. All of these loves will fail us from time to time. This one, this is the one. Paul says, agape never fails, ever. So I was trying to figure out, how do I illustrate this in a way that it'll stick so that when you walk out of here, you go, okay, I... I get it, or at least I have a better understanding. And I thought about Joe last week. When he taught, he had a great prop, didn't he? It was a chicken. And I might add, it's a well-behaved chicken. I don't know if there are misbehaved chickens, because I don't spend that much time around chickens. But in the second service, which I was not at, I was at the first service, but at the, somebody told me in the middle of the second service, the chicken, halfway through Joe's message, just turned and looked at him. I think the chicken got saved during the message. I, I don't know for sure, but... <laughs> but I'd like to buy its eggs just in case, you know? <laughs> so I thought about, like, what prop could I use? And I thought about bringing in our dog, Bailey. Uh, and then I thought, you may, Bailey would be so freaked out after the 915, I thought I would bring in our daughter Chrissy's down here. I thought I'd bring in her big black lab marbles at 1115. Because I, I thought about, um, but, but then I, you know, just the logistics and everything, and the dogs would... They would just do what dogs do. Bailey would flip out. He'd be like running over and yipping and barking and probably disrupt the whole service. But then I thought, that's kind of the point with regard to agape. Agape love is all neat and clean and sanitized and predictable. It, it's, it's kind of, it, there, it's, it, there's a sort of wild card side to agape love. When you express agape love, you, you don't know how it's going to turn out. You don't know whether they're going to reciprocate you don't, you know, if it's your dog, you don't even know if the dog will even be aware. Half the time, human beings aren't aware. For God so loved the world, he gave his son. Half the human race is unaware that agape has already been expressed for them. So when we express agape, whether it's to our dog or to a, a family member, we don't know how it's going to turn out. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. The risk in agape is that the world might kill him. And it did. 
We did. But God did not love the world so much that he sent his one and only son because you and I are so lovable. God so loved the world because it's the heart of God. And when your heart is full of agape love, this rigorous, challenging, tenacious, tough, enduring love, you have to express that or your heart will explode. So this agape love of God has little to do with how pretty, how beautiful, how well-mannered we all are, any more than it does our dogs. It has to do with the heart of God. And you think about our dogs. Think about if for those, how many of you have dogs, by the way? Okay? How many of you have cats? Okay, you, that doesn't count. If, <laughs> if I do a series on the demonic, I will use the cat as an illustration. But. So save the emails. I, I just... Just messing with you. But when our dogs were puppies, they're so cute, but they're not cute all the time. They're not cute when they're pooping and peeing all over the house or chewing on your furniture or stealing your socks. A couple months ago, I had Chrissy's dog, Marbles. Marbles is awesome. And I'm, it's on a Sunday morning. I'm getting ready for the service. I'm drinking my coffee, and I had a muffin on the table. I was going over my message, and I went to reach for the muffin. Well, Marbles had snuggled up. I just thought he wanted to be by his grampy. No, no, he's... He's scoping out the muffin, and he's huge, and he just, woof, the thing was gone. <laughs> they lounge around, they shed, they basically don't contribute anything to the household, but we love them, don't we, with this kind of crazy love. Sometimes I look at Bailey, he's just sitting on the couch, he's not doing a thing, I just look at him, and I'm just, we just, it's just this love burst. Same thing with Marbles or Bea, who's our son and daughter-in-law. Bea, you got to pray for Bea. That dog's like got issues. But anyway, <laughs> but, but we just send out these love beams to them, and they sense it, and they come running with their tail wagging, and then they lick us, and we pet them, and it's awesome. <laughs> so here's what we learn about the Jesus revolution, about love from our dogs. I think we learn this from people, too, but... The first thing is this. The Jesus revolution was sparked by the heart of the lover, not the beauty or the performance of the beloved. It's a very difficult thing to get your head and heart around. Because most of the time we think, if I'm going to be lovable, I have to fill in the blank. Behave or do this or don't do that. But the Jesus revolution was sparked by the heart of a lover not the performance of the beloved. Because let me come back to our dogs. I mean, as, as cute as they can be, let's face it, they can be rascals sometimes, can't they? I mean, sometimes uh, they will eat out of the garbage. They will drink out of the toilet. Yeah, I know, gross. They, they, they'll get sprayed with skunks. They lick themselves in places that are disgusting, and then they want to lick us, okay? I, just saying. But we love them anyway. It's this sort of irrational love. And guess what? In our own human way, we can be rascals too. And there is this God who loves us when we're at our best and when we're at our worst. One of my favorite verses in the New Testament is the Apostle Paul. I think reflecting on his own life and his own sin, he wrote in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, these words. He said, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us when we were at our best all decked out, perfume, well-behaved. No, that's not what it says. It said he sent Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And the word sinners there, I mean, that's sort of all-encompassing. Jesus died for us when, when we had made false idols out of things. He died for us when we broke our marriage vows and committed adultery. He, 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 he died for us when, when we went on shooting rampages and when we lied and cheated and deceived and made a mess out of relationships and made a mess out of the world. For God so loved the world that he sent his son to die for us. See, God doesn't love us because we're always so lovable. And it's hard for us to imagine because of our, these sort of limited loves up here. But Jesus loved and died for Jeffrey Dahmers. Jesus loved and died for Adolf Hitler. Jesus loved and, 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 and gave his life for Madeleine Murray O'Hara, who spent her whole adult life railing against the God that she claimed didn't exist. Jesus loved and died for James Holmes, the young man who went on the shooting rampage in Aurora, Colorado. And that does not mean that God loves everything we do. 
that's, that's a whole other matter. Some of the things that we do are dumb and dangerous, aren't they? But Jesus' revolution was sparked by his unconditional love for us, for every single one of us. And that's radical. It's unparalleled in any faith system. In fact, it's so radical, it begs the question, where did the idea of agape even come from? Well, it, it came out of God's word. The Apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John, he also wrote the book of Revelation. He wrote three epistles, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. In 1st John chapter 4, verse 8, he says, God is love. Love is at the core of God's nature. Now, I might add, because the word love has been tainted so much, it's become so sentimental and so whatever, wishy-washy. God is love, but God is a, God is a, it's a holy love, friends. It's holy in the sense that it's unstained by sentimentality and human sin. It's a holy love in the sense that it does not sweep our sin under the rug or ignore it. It doesn't minimize, rationalize, or deny it. It's a holy love in the sense that it looks at the evil of sin and calls it what it is. And yet, instead of being recoiled by it, this agape love moves toward it. It moves toward our sin and our brokenness to cover it and to remove it and to save us and to redeem us. If you want to know what agape love really looks like, Take a look at that. And I know that that's a symbol that we're familiar with. But I want you to remember that 2,000 years ago, a man was brutally, brutally beaten. And nails were driven through his hands and his feet. And on that cross, he said, Father, forgive them. That's love of another kind. But Jesus' revolution, this revolution of love was so mind-blowing, so powerful that it broke down barriers in the first century that people didn't even realize were barriers because they were so entrenched in the culture. It broke down racial barriers between Jews and non-Jews, Gentiles, Jews and Samaritans. They, they, their hatred for each other was probably three times the hatred of whites and blacks in the 1950s in the Deep South. The Jesus revolution, this revolution of agape, it broke down uh, economic barriers that had existed between the wealthy and the poor. You can read about that in Acts chapter 2. It's amazing. It broke down gender barriers between men and women where men and women uh, were now worshiping together and breaking bread together and praying together. This did, it, it didn't happen in the first century. This was absolutely unheard of. By this, this agape love, Jesus said, the world will know who my followers are. Now, how, how are we doing with that? It, that's, that's really the question of the day. How are we doing with this, this agape love, this, this tough, unconditional, selfless, servant love? A few months back, the History Channel ran a docudrama, I guess it was, on, on the Hatfields and McCoys. Now, I don't really know like a lot about the Hatfields and McCoys, but I remember hearing about them as a kid. I just knew that that they were two families that didn't like each other. You guys at least that familiar? And, uh, I mean, and, and the hatred went on uh, between them for over 100 years. In fact, I think in the documentary, it, it, it suggested that there's been a, maybe like a little bit of a thawing or a breakthrough in the late 20th or early 21st century. But the Hatfields and McCoys, here's an interesting thing about them. They both considered themselves to be Christian families, followers of Jesus. But what were they most known for? Their hatred of each other. By this, the world will know that you are my disciples, by your hatred one to another. You know, really, if you think about it in modern terms, who in the world would want to be part of any local church if it was marked by the kind of hatred that was exhibited between the Hatfields and McCoys? There's enough of that in the world. Years ago, Bill Hybels, who's the founding pastor of Willow Creek uh, Community Church, told a story, I think, at a global leadership summit, which we're hosting here this Thursday and Friday, but Bill told a story, he was in an airport one day, and he saw two boys, two brothers, and their parents weren't there. And they were, I don't know for sure, but I'm thinking they were maybe like 10 and 7. And the brothers started getting into it. They started, you know, like brothers will do. But, what, but at a certain point, the older brother knocked the younger brother down and with a bare-fisted knuckle started to punch the kid right in the face. 
I mean, he was giving this kid a serious beatdown. And then the older brother completely went psycho. And he took the younger brother by the hair and was smashing his skull into the hard tile floor. And Bill's watching. I mean, it was like violent blood. And he's looking around, and there's, there's no parents there. So he has to, you know, and he's trying to catch a flight, and he ends up getting in the middle of it all. But at the end of all that, as he was processing what he saw and experienced, he had this moment of clarity, this defining moment. And he basically came to the conclusion that Jesus Christ, in and through the local church, the imperfect, deeply flawed, kind of messed up, maybe even seriously messed up, local church, is the hope of the world. It is only the Jesus revolution, a revolution of love, that has the power to change the trajectory of the lives of those boys, to break the cycles of neglect and violence that they probably witnessed, and to give them a kind of love and, and a sense of forgiveness and uh, healthy boundaries to live a kind of new life. If the church does not step up and exhibit the love of Jesus, the love that he said the world would know you're my disciples, I, I think it's lights out. And for Bill and for me, it, it gave a whole new sense of urgency regarding the mission of the local church. Nobody has to tell me about our foibles, about our warts, about how imperfect we are and we don't get it. I, I'm well aware of that. I'm well aware of it in my life and I hear enough stories. But I'm telling you, it is the love of Jesus in and through this community and other communities like us that if we don't get love for God and love for each other right, at least most of the time, the world is going to live in utter darkness. It's that big of a deal. And that brings us to the last part of the message. The love that sparks the revolution is the love that sustains it. 1 John 4, verse 7. John says, dear friends, let us continue to love one another. And I, I want you to hear that. Continue to love one another. In other words, love has an ongoing an enduring quality to it. It's not like when you come to faith in Jesus, you get a Jesus jolt. You know, like a triple espresso latte shot of love that lasts for the rest of your life. It doesn't work that, it doesn't work that way for me. In fact, when I was writing that out and I thought about that, that concept of a shot of love, I thought about Bob Dylan. Shot of love. Anybody? Yeah, I see a hand waving. I need, I need, I need a shot of love. Oh, you guys, a lot of you have missed out on it. Man, I'm telling you, that song rocks. It's so, go to YouTube, check it out. Bob Dylan's Shot of Love. And I thought, we need a shot of love. We need, we need shots. I don't know if you're thinking this kind of shot or this kind of shot, but we need, <laughs> we need shots of love. We do. The love that sparked the revolution is the love that sustains the revolution. But if, if we're going to be able to give this love away, it's got to flow into us. And how does that work? Because without love, the revolution dies. Without love, we just have dead religion. Without love, nobody will know that we're disciples of Jesus. So how does that love flow? Well, it flows, I mean, it flows in a lot of ways. But Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 5, he said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Very simple metaphor. You don't have to be a, you know, an agriculture or horticulturalist. You don't have to be like a wine specialist. Vine, branch. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever remains in me and I in him, that person will bear much fruit. The point he's making there is intimacy with Jesus is how, how love flows into us. It's intima intimacy with Jesus that causes love to flow out of us. If we don't have an intimate relationship, and I can't do that for you and you can't do it for me, but if there's no intimacy with Jesus, the, the flow of love is just going to dry up. So how, how does that work? Well, that, that's why we talk about things like worship, like gathering on Sundays. Uh, you know, I don't come here just because it's my job. Because if it wasn't my job, I would still gather with a community of Christ followers. And I don't come here because God will be mad at me if I don't show up. It's, it's not about that. I come here because I need a shot of love. Anybody else? I do. I, I, need, I need to like, whether it's a song, whether it's a it might be, it, sometimes I get a shot of love just through a hug. Sometimes I get a shot of love just by knowing I'm not, I'm not trying to serve and live for Jesus by myself. I'm part of a family. It gets me fired up. 
because I forget sometimes. And, and sometimes I get a shot of love when I connect with God through, through the Bible and through prayer and through Christian music. And I, I don't read my Bible and, and pray because it's this religious duty. It's really about relational connection. When I read God's word and, and, and I think about it and then I, I kind of say, well, how does this affect my family or my finances or the way I lead the church? I mean, th this, is, this is a divine encounter where his word, his life, his guidance has fallen into me. Because I'll, I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to be much of a husband, father, grandfather, pastor, friend. I'm not going to be much of anything. If I don't have the love of Jesus flowing into me on a regular basis, I'm just telling you, I need a shot of love, and I need it on a regular basis, and I think you do too. It's the same thing with small groups. Small groups, that's the optimal environment for love to be given and received. It's the same thing with why we serve. When I'm serving others in the name of Jesus, I'm expressing his agape love in ways that, you know, just make the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven come to this earth. So if you want to be part of the Jesus revolution that was sparked by love and is sustained by love, it starts with intimacy with him. So whether it's corporate worship like this or personal worship, sometimes, I don't do this often enough, but I've gone out on our deck at night on a star-filled night. And we have those, what are those chairs called, Rose? The zero gravity or whatever. There are these lounge chairs where you tip back and you guys know what I'm talking about? And sometimes I'll go out at night and the stars are just everywhere and I'll just tip back and just kind of like these lights, I'll just look. And just, just in the solitude be rocked by the majesty of God and his creation. And it just kind of gets me fired up again that the God who made all of those stars, he knows me by name. Not a hair will fall from my head without him knowing. It's like, wow, talk about a shot of love. Now, stay with me on this, friends. I'm heading for the finish line. We are surrounded, all of us, every day, with people who have never, ever, not one time, experienced this. Agape. I, I deal with people all the time who have been neglect, neglected, ignored, and kicked around, and generally treated as if their life had no value. And maybe you're sitting here, maybe you're watching via video, and you're going, man, that's my story. And there's something in your heart that's crying, hungering and thirsting for that kind of love. And you're going, I need a shot of love. I'm just going to flat out tell you the source of that is Jesus. If you look for it anywhere else, you're not going to find it. You might find this, you might find this, you might find this. You will not find this apart from Jesus. He's the source. He's the vine. So I would just say call out to him from the depth of your heart. You can do it right where you're sitting. You can do it right now. You don't have to do anything, but in your heart, just say, man, if there's a love <clears throat> where there's no strings attached, if there's a God who knows the good, the bad, and the ugly about me, and he loves me totally and completely, and he wants to come into my life, not to beat me up, but to forgive me and to, you know, to just live inside of me in, in a relationship of love, man, if, if that's you, I don't know of a better deal on the planet. It doesn't cost you anything because it cost him everything. It's already been paid for. Free and clear. All you can do is open up your heart and say, come in. If you haven't done that, oh, man, do it. And come see me after the service or see somebody. Ask them what that's all about. But for the rest of us, I want to remind us of a movie that came out a couple years ago. And it had to do with a marriage that was in deep trouble. The film was called Fireproof. I'm sure some of you have seen it. The movie was about a typical married couple. They, they meet, they fall in love, and then they fall out of love and end up hating each other. I see it all the time. But the breakthrough came when the father of the husband, who was a deeply committed follower of Jesus, he came to his son. He said, son, <clears throat> I want to give you a, what he called a love dare. 40-day challenge to love his wife even though, even though the filial, the emotional love was dead as a doornail. That it doesn't matter. Love her anyway. Um, treat her with kindness. Do things that will express love to her. The son, because he loved his father, said, okay, dad, I'll do it. Well, his heart wasn't in it, and his wife knew it, and he kept getting slammed and slammed and slammed. Finally, he said, that's it. I've had it. I'm, 
His father said, don't give up, son. <laughs> give it one more shot. And about midway through the love dare, God did something in the heart of the husband. All of a sudden, the husband was convicted by the fact that it was patently obvious to everybody else his heart wasn't in it. He was just going through the motions. And somehow, there was this encounter when he became aware of, of his profound selfishness. And he, this was not about his wife now, this was about him. And he cried out and said, God, I need you to forgive me. There's all kinds of sin in my life. And this isn't even really about my marriage anymore. This is about me, the kind of man I've become. And in that moment, he experienced the agape love of God. He experienced a wave of mercy that washed over him. And in the process of confessing his sin and receiving God's unconditional love, God placed in his heart a genuine, authentic love for his wife. And so he continued on with that love there. And it wasn't easy. Day after day after day, his wife just slammed him. But, he, but she could see something had happened in his heart. And over a period of time, love won. Agape won. It wasn't eros. It wasn't filial love. It wasn't storia. It was agape love that won. You see, the revolution that broke through in him was now able to flow through him. And it was messy. And it was hard. But that's real love, friends. That's agape love. It's tough. It's enduring. It doesn't give up. And I've been thinking about this concept of love because it's, it's at the foundation of our mission. It's the foundation of the Jesus revolution. Loving God. Growing believers. Reaching people who don't know Jesus. I thought the danger with today's message is to move on too quickly. So it, this is a four-part series, and I thought, what if we could create a Bay Point Love Dare for the next 28 days? What if, like in the movie, we had a daily challenge to express agape love to people in our lives, families and friends and neighbors and maybe people we don't even know? So I sat down, and I came up with 28 different expressions of love one per day for the next four weeks, starting tomorrow. You could even start it today if you want. And these are simple. You don't know, this, this is not like for the theological giants. So let me show you what day one is. Day one, take someone to Moomers and pay for their ice cream. Or Cold Stone, I mean, I don't, you know, whatever. But you know. And I don't know, if you're lactose intolerant, go figure it out. You, you, and if you want to swap Moomers for another day, you can do it. But the point is this, what sparked the Jesus revolution? Say it with me, love. What sustains the Jesus revolution? Say it with me, love. Well, then it's up to us, friends. If you, you say you want a revolution, well, if you want a revolution, the kind of revolution that heals and builds up and restores and is full of love, you got to follow the revolutionary. And we have an opportunity to do that in very simple, practical ways over the next four weeks. And I hope you will. I hope you'll join me in that journey. I don't know if I'll hit all 28. Maybe I'll hit three in one day and miss a couple others. But I'm going to do the best I can to continue that revolution that Jesus started years ago. So why don't we stand and we'll close in prayer. And uh, before I pray, I just want to mention that um, next week we're going to talk about growing uh, believers. And... Um, the song that we're going to use next week is, Help, I Need Somebody. So uh, now that you know that, I hope that you'll reach out to somebody that might need that too and bring them with you next week. And I want to let you know, if you're new to Bay Point, if you've just been worshiping with us for a little while, we're going to have a very brief gathering, five or ten minutes, over in the prayer room. It's just an opportunity for me and some staff members. We might have an elder or two stop in, but it's just a chance to connect with those of you who are newer, just to say hi and maybe share a little bit about who we are, answer whatever questions you may have. So you're all invited to stop in in the prayer room. So, Father, thank you so much for this revolution that, um, that you and your Son and the Holy Spirit started many, many years ago. We live in a world when you think about revolutions, man, it gets ugly fast. We've seen pictures of the Holocaust. We've seen pictures of Darfur and Sudan. Um, the depravity of humankind seems to know no bounds, but neither does the love of God. And so, God, I pray that in our hearts, and in our church, that the agape love of God would be the spark that starts and keeps this revolution going. Let it, let it revolutionize our own life. Let it revolutionize our church. And let it root 
revolutionize our family and this community and ultimately the world. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our revolutionary. And everybody who agreed said, Amen. Thanks for coming, everybody. God bless you.